friends, colleagues, students, um, family, and above all, our inaugural lecturer, Professor Louise Edwards, welcome to this afternoon's inaugural lecture. I'm Ian Martin, I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic, and it's my privilege to be able to um, act as MC and officiate here this afternoon. Um, in opening today, and welcoming you to the university, I'd like to pay my respect and acknowledge the Bidjigal people, the traditional owners of the land on which the university is built, and pay my respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and their leaders, both past and present. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this inaugural lecture. Inaugural lectures mark the most important academic transition in a career to being appointed to the role of professor, the highest rank that we have. They've been introduced to this university in 2015, but they hold a long and usually distinguished tradition in the history of universities. Their origins date back to medieval times when universities were in fact little more than guilds, monastic guilds, and it marked the transition from being an apprentice to being a master. And to mark that transition, in the Middle Ages, a tradition of speaking and engaging with your peers for the first time became part of academic life. It wasn't at that stage a professorial inaugural lecture, and indeed the title professor wasn't really used properly until the 16th century, so the two didn't quite line up. But that transition from apprentice to master in the medieval guilds was marked in this way, and it is something that many universities have continued to this date. Their history is interesting and I'm not a historian, and we have a historian with us, so I'm slightly nervous about going into history. But when they first started, they were somewhat more prolonged and fulsome than the inaugural lecture this afternoon. And they could actually last for days. And the inaugural lecturer would be expected to speak to one audience on the first day, one audience on the second day, and one audience on the third day. Usually, representing the town, the students, and their colleagues, but often all sorts of combinations in between. But it wasn't only that. Yes, the Guild was happy to mark the entrance of their new professor into the Guild, but they expected something back. So the person giving the inaugural lecture was expected to entertain the Guild for those three days by means of food and drink a tradition I think we should definitely resume. <laughs> but it got more interesting than that, because in entering the Guild, this was an opportunity to palm off some of the less nice tasks to the new member of the Guild. And in, certainly in some universities, there was a tradition that the person who gave the inaugural lecture for the next 40 days was expected to preside, preside over all disputations that were registered with the Guild for that time. An interesting proposition that we might think about returning. So any disputes about car parks, office allocations, leave allocations, we have somebody to manage it for UNSW for the next 40 days. All joking aside, this is a very important transition and it is a great tradition that UNSW has adopted at the moment to really bring the concept of the inaugural lecture here to mark that tradition. And today, there's no exception to that. And it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce our inaugural lecturer this afternoon, Professor Louise Edwards. Louise is a professor of Chinese history and Asian studies at UNSW's Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. She's currently president of the Asian Studies Association of Australia and editor-in-chief of the association's Women in Asia book series. A graduate from Griffith University's Asian and International Studies program, Louise has worked at UQ, ACU, ANU, UTS, and Hong Kong University prior to joining UNSW. Between 2004 and 2009, she was convener of the ARC's Asia Pacific Research, Futures Research Network, and from 2005 to 2009, director of the UTS China Research Center. After graduating in Chinese and politics from the University of Auckland in a native New Zealand, Louise studied at Beijing's Foreign Languages Institute and Nanjing University, and she's since held research fellowships at the National Center Library and the Academy of Sinica in Taiwan. Louise publishes on women and gender in Asia, most specifically on China from a cultural and political historical perspective. Her most recent sole author books include Women, Politics and Democracy, 
women's suffrage in China, and women warriors and wartime spies of China. In 2014, two of her books were published in Chinese, Men and Women in Qing China, has appeared in Peking University Press, and Women, Politics and Democracy with People's Publishing House. A truly distinguished background, and with that, it's my very great pleasure to invite Louise Edwards to deliver her inaugural lecture. Louise. And yeah, while I'm a really good speaker, I promise I can't do it without my notes. So lucky you uh, returned them to me. Thanks very much, Ian. <laughs> you want to see me fly by the seat of my pants. Okay, well, thank you very much, Professor Martin, and also to our Dean of the Faculty, Professor Eileen Baldry, for making this um, opportunity possible for me. It's, uh, it's a really uh, rare opportunity to share my research and um, what I believe in, I guess, with a wider audience. So thank you all for coming, ladies and gentlemen. I want to spend a little bit of time um, uh, talking about um, the family and friends that have, uh, that have come with me on the official party today. I've got uh, three nieces and a, a sister-in-law and my supervisor from Griffith who've come with me today to uh, provide moral support. And the reason that I was so keen for them to come, one of them's gone, or two of them have gone the, the back row, but okay. Um, one of the things that's important about these three, particularly the nieces, um, is that they really represent the way that Australian society has nurtured women's education. And while we take it for granted now, the fact that three incredibly talented young women have been given the chance by three different types of schools, they've all gone to different types of schools within the New South Wales system, and they've come to be geniuses in maths and science as well as creative arts and, and all sorts of other kind of um, arty things is really amazing. So it means a lot to me to have Hannah and Philippa and uh, Maylene here today. There's also a couple of other nieces and, and, and lurking in New Zealand and, uh, and, and other places that um, aren't here and of course nephews, but today it's all about the women. Um, as well as um, uh, as well as well uh, the nieces, I have this a lovely sister-in-law who's a teacher, a head teacher in uh, learning support at Cogra High School and Anne's being one of those people that has made the social cohesion that gives Australia what it really, what really holds it together. She's been one of those people right at the coalface She's worked at Punchbowl Boys, Canterbury Boys, and most of you who know Sydney will know those are the places where, where you know, social cohesion is really being built. And so I really have enormous respect for, um, for the work that Anne does. She has a daughter who's also gone into teaching, who's teaching at the moment at Ashfield, uh, Ashfield Primary. And my own daughter has gone into teaching in Melbourne, so she couldn't be here today. But it's, it's a career that really makes a difference in young people's lives, and it creates the amazing young people that have become my nieces, but also who have... Um, and many of the people that we, we love to teach. And then finally, the last person on my, on my uh, official party is my supervisor from Griffith, um, Professor, Emeritus Professor Mary Farquhar, who's a world leader in Chinese cinema and also in, um, in uh, uh, children's literature. And I know there's a few China Studies people here, so now that you know Mary's here, you can grab her if you want to talk to her. I know there's some cinema people in the audience uh, from UTS in particular. Um, so that's really... Um, you know that's that, that's the official party. I'm really grateful that you could all come come today. I should, without getting too much behind time, um, move on to my into my lecture. One of the things I have to do is learn how to use the technology. Okay, these are two book covers from um, the, the last two sort of major books that I did. The one on the left is with Stanford U Press, and that was um, the one that um, Ian mentioned about gender politics and democracy. And this one, I started looking at the way that women use legislative change to affect um, to improve women's lives. So how did they get the vote, then get into parliament, and then change uh, things like the divorce laws, the um, uh, inheritance laws, the rights to education. And this was all happening in the first half of the 20th century in China. And while I was researching that one, I came across a bunch of other women who said, you know, political change is too slow. We want a revolution. We want to get with the guns. We want, we want military action to actually effect change. And so I figured that the next book I'd do would look at those women, the impatient ones, the ones that weren't happy to just sit around and, and shuffle papers. They wanted to really get in with the action. And the more that I looked at these in this uh, second book, the one that's coming out in March next year, the more that I looked at these women, the more that I realised that while they were interesting during their lifetime, they actually had really much more interesting, or well, equally as interesting, afterlives as propaganda pieces, as people who were had their histories being used by um, different types of groups, commercial groups, government groups, rebel groups, to encourage people to go to war. 
And so their propaganda life was really, really interesting and really, really important. But then I had two kind of projects. I had this historical approach and I had this cultural um, legacy approach. And I didn't know how to go ahead, go to, to get my head around it. And so one day I was sitting on uh, Mary's uh, veranda in Brisbane, slapping mosquitoes and wiping sweat and drinking wine and, and, and basically Mary helped me nut out how I would merge these two, two types of material. So it's not really a standard history. It doesn't just use archival material. It's using films and it's using literature. It's using school textbooks. It's using posters. It's using ballets like the one up there. And it's trying to bring together not only the history of these women, but how they have been used in more contemporary um, all the way through the 20th and 21st century. Um, what I guess I came to the conclusion um, at the end of all that, the conclusion I came to was that women and women soldiers and women spies were particularly effective in propaganda around softening populations up to go to war. So, and, and we normally call that process militarization. So if you, uh, you have a bad idea like a war is, because we know that it causes refugees, it causes pandemics, it causes destruction of economies, it causes you know blowings up of... of health and welfare, wealth uh, that, we, that we all know and love and, and it causes a lot of death. As well as that, we have, so we have, to have, um, we have to have ways to make this work. We have to have ways that leadership groups, whether it be they uh, rebel leaders or government leaders, encourage us to actually put our money and put our time and put our, our lives at risk to, to join these campaigns. And so how do they do that? What is, the, you know, what is, the, what is that process? And academics will call this militarization. And it occurs not just in peacetime, but it also occurs in wartime, equally as, as frequently. In wartime, it's more intensive, but in peacetime, we just get a kind of low-level um, process of keeping the urgency of war and keeping the urgency of um, war preparedness um, in our consciousness. Um, so you've got to persuade people that war is a good option. Most people aren't in in instantly leaping to war as a first solution. So what do we... We know that we need persuasion, and what is the industry that is best at persuading? The best industry at persuading is advertising. So when I was looking at how do, <laughs> how do um, leadership groups persuade us that war was a good thing, I instantly turned to the Gruen Transfer, which most of you will know is an ABC show. It talks about advertising, how advertising works and what it does. And one of the things that uh, the Gruen Transfer um, did a few years back was um, pitch two companies against each other to see who could come up with the best um, campaign to sell the unsellable or sell a really hard product. And of course, for Australians, I say of course, but we hope this is the case, for Australians, one really hard product to sell would be to invade New Zealand. And so the idea was you had two companies trying to work out the best way to persuade Australians to invade New Zealand. Now, at that point, and it's, that competition is called the pitch, which is why that, that picture has a pitch up there. One company decided to flip a very successful New Zealand advertising campaign, which still operates today, right? The 100% pure New Zealand. And that's a very effective advertising campaign, huge success for the country. And they reversed it. And they used the fact that New Zealand's government had recently made the decision, this is about 10 years ago, made the decision not to buy any more um, fighter jets. So the Air Force no longer has fighter jets. They would just put money into the transport planes, and they'd still have an Air Force, but they wouldn't have they re decided not to have the capacity to you know, bomb other countries. Now, this, of course, is a great, a great thing if you want to um, make a joke about how easy New Zealand would be to invade. And so this is what they're saying. Oh, it's just 100% too easy. It's uh, just 100% there for the taking. And so this was the kind of pitch they were making. The other co company that was a competing company was saying, well, let's appeal to what makes Australians tick the long weekend. Everybody loves the long weekend. And so we have a holiday for Anzac, so let's have a holiday for the divorce of Anzac, you know, the Australians versus the New Zealanders. And we'll invade New Zealand and we'll get a holiday out of it because, you know, we're going to win. So there's your kangaroo and your emu knocking back the lagers. And while this is kind of a, an amusing kind of take on, you know, on advertising and persuasion, my point in the book is that actually war takes... War does advertise itself, and military, people who want us to go to war will spend a lot of time softening us up for it. We're often just not aware of it because it's so commonplace and it's so much part of our daily consumption. 
and a couple of it, it in, in, impregnates every part of our social fabric, and pun intended, because we even get camouflage fashion, right? So it becomes a normalised part of walking around, going shopping, going to the uh, going to the gym. Oop, come along, photo. Yeah, you've got your skinny jeans. You've got your peace world camo gear with his and hers options. You've got baby camo gear if you want to fit your diapers on. So you've got camo gear everywhere, camouflage stuff, as if you were fighting a guerrilla warf warfare. There goes my watch. Okay. So it's, it's kind of naturalized within our societies, and, it, be and it, it becomes part of us. It also becomes part of places we know. Not only we get streets, we get universities, we get um, boulevards, we get, you name it, named after wars, battles, um, particular troops, particular types of uh, soldiering. And one of these is that wonderful bridge, the Anzac Bridge, which I go dragon boating in several times a week. And I see one of my friends there from dragon boating, Mark McCain, is also here today. Thank you for coming. And it's great fun. So if you want to join dragon boating, do give me a yell. And we paddle under this bridge, um, and it's beautiful. And I, every time I'm under there, I think, why isn't it Medicare Bridge? Right? Why do we have two soldiers standing at the end of that bridge instead of some GPs, some, new, some midwives, some um, uh, hospital orderlies, some of those scientists who make great vaccines? Why haven't we got commemoration and celebration of some other types of things in this bridge name? You know, why do we default to, uh, to a militarised one? And it's part of a, a kind of ongoing acceptance that we have of this, you know, this, this kind, of, um, kind of thinking. Um, so, women, like bridges and like camouflage clothing and fashion, can be really useful tools for uh, militarization, for total militarization is what I'm proposing is out there. That it's not enough just to say to men, you have to go to war or you're not a real man. It's not enough just to get the men involved. You want to get everybody involved, babies in camo clothing, women in, involved as well. And so total militarization is, is really good if you want to include um, it can, can occur if you want to include all aspects of society and, and all members of society, including um, women. And what, a, what I'm uh, trying to argue through the book is that there are a number of ways that women perform these roles. The first of these is by making war a bit more sexy, makes it look more fun. If you've got some women in nice cheap holes there, it looks much more fun than blowing up babies. Um, you've got another, uh, and I'll show that through the example of a, a woman spy uh, called Jung Ping and the second one is that they uh, gap in the notes here. Uh, the second one is that women provide an emotional hook for propaganda. Advertising and propaganda requires us to get sort of hooked into the message, and women provide a really good conduit for getting an emotional hook into a product, which is why they feature so much in uh, in advertising, and they feature in this kind of war advertising as well. Um, and I'll look at that example through the case of this woman Zhao Yiman. Many of you from China and China studies will know these people. And then the last case study I'll, I'll look at is one by a, a, a woman who was a soldier and an author. So she wrote a lot of um, reportage and she wrote a lot of diaries. And her name's Xie Bingying. And she shows us the way that social movements like feminism can be co-opted into a militarized way of thinking such that you can't think of feminism without thinking of going to war. So um, this is the kind of uh, argument that I'm making through the book. And the book has like 10 chapters, one of which was the um, Red Detachment of Women. That's, well, that was the book cover. And you know they were real women spies and soldiers who fought in the southern part of China in the, in the early 1930s. There were 104 of them. The 19 got killed in battle. The others were kind of captured in 1933 and taken as war booty or jailed. But they were real women. And in the 1960s and 1970s, their story was taken up such that almost everyone in China can sing a song from the movies and the, and the ballets that these women, the Red Detachment, um, became really famous for. But they were real women, and a couple of them only died a few years back. So this is the first one. This is this uh, woman spy, Zhang Pingwu. So she, um, she died in, 19, well, she was executed in 1940. That's the real sort of picture of her on the cover of uh, um, a very famous magazine from the 1930s. And it was a kind of, she was, so she was a cover girl. She was also interestingly half Japanese and half um, 
half Chinese. So her mum was Japanese and her dad was Chinese. So she was fluent in both languages and moved between both, both uh, societies. So when Japan invaded China in the early 30s and, then, and really seriously in 1937, she was really a useful person to have around. She could mingle, she knew the top echelons of, of both groups and she could mingle quite as a native in both groups. And so the Nationalist Party uh, of China decided to co-opt her to their campaign and to insert her into the um, into Shanghai, where she, well, she was already there, living in Shanghai, to insert her into their movement to try and get the top security guy, or one of the top security guys in Shanghai, assassinated. So this guy was a kind of like, you know, not a very nice character, a guy called Ding Mozun, and she, but he had a real soft spot for beautiful women. So they took this young university graduate, cover girl, and put her into this um, world where she would meet Ding Mozun. She meets him, he does get kind of, you know, soft on her, and one day they're going shopping. She pretends by chance that she will, she needs to buy a fur coat, or she wants to buy a fur coat. And she uh, says, look, there's the Siberian fur shop. Let's stop here and get me a fur coat. He doesn't know that this is actually a setup, and she's got her assassins waiting outside the shop, ready to take him out. But of course, this is a guy who's been, who's faced many, many, many assassination attempts. So he's pretty attuned to what's going on around him. He gets out of the car, sees a couple of guys lurking, leaps back in the car, and off they go with bullets flying. Now, Zhang Pingru is standing there going, has my cover been blown or has it not? She wasn't quite sure. So she kind of thinks on the optimistic side, I'll pretend it was just by chance. So she goes back into uh, Ding Mozun's house, you know, where the, the spy den, and kind of carries on as if, it, hoping to carry on as if it's normal. She takes a Japanese officer with her, hoping that that'll protect her if something has gone wrong. Unfortunately, uh, she was outed. She was jailed, she was interrogated, and eventually taken out to a field in uh, the back of Shanghai and shot. And so her, her life then is, you know, is one of contribution, but it's also one of danger. However, in the afterlife of how she is depicted, we see that she's used very much to cover up the dirty side of war you don't, and to um, amplify the glamour of war. And so we see the woman spy always in a nice hat, always wearing the best makeup, always wearing the nice fur, always going to nice parties. And the war you'd think in Shanghai was all about wine and dining and, and partying. And this is a really important message that a lot of militarised thinking and people who are invested in militarised thinking want to get out. They don't, they don't want you to know about the other side. They want your brain to be occupied with the, the real glamour side of it. You know, you always get to wear a nice hat if you're in the war, right? And you get to wear these great cosmetics. So while you're doing that, you're not thinking about other stuff. You get in, the tw in 2007, in the, tw you know, in the 21st century, your story gets told in an even more glamorous way. You get to like, be, a, be with Tony Loom, and you get to you know, hang out with you know, amazing cheap house and amazing uh, hats because of this um, Ang Lee movie. So, and it is highly sexualized. So the woman spy is regarded almost routinely as being a woman sex spy, so using their charms. And the, I think all of you could probably think of half a dozen movies about women spies that glamorizes the whole operation. And this is important, right? You, you have that in the forefront of your head, you don't have this in the forefront of your head. The real, well, Zhang Pingru was a real spy, but the majority of spies in China and Shanghai in particular at this time were you know, street sellers, people who were selling sugarcane, and people who were like middle-aged women, you know, uh, what do you call it, capitalising on their invisibility as middle-aged women to just go about intelligence gathering and move it within the city. So while you're thinking it's all glamour, you're ignoring these people and you're certainly ignoring this stuff where you've got ho houses being destroyed and uh, you know, families being torn asunder, a very famous Life magazine picture of the baby. So, you know, war propaganda tends to sexualize, tends to make it and, and glamorize what goes on rather than, uh, you know, present a reality, which is, you know, fair enough, it's entertainment. But I want us to think about what the implications of that entertainment are. The second way that women are useful to this total militarization is through providing emotional hooks. 
and that, you know, you get the message of patriotic sacrifice, which is what most governments want us to do. They want us to rush up to the front and die, for, die with a bullet for our country. They themselves wouldn't do it, but they want us to do it. So they tell you about patriotic sacrifice. And if a woman does it, it's way more effective than a man because men do it all the time. You know, thousands and thousands of men have died in wars and you hardly know one name. Whereas Zhao Yiman dies in a war and almost everybody in China knows her name. So it's way more powerful if you have these exceptional behaviours. And because women are deemed traditionally to be cowardly or weak, not very, you know, very capable of military action of the, or not having the qualities that you would normally think of as a heroic warrior, the fact that a woman has these qualities or can be depicted as having these qualities makes it a more powerful message. People get hooked into the story. If you have two war movies, one with a woman, one with a man, you can be guaranteed that the woman's story will, will be the one that pe more people are interested in. You're much more able to achieve your total militarization with the woman as the protagonist. Now, Zhao Yiman, how much time have I got? Okay, Zhao Yiman was um, as a Sichuan woman and she was fighting against the Japanese. She was a communist and is now the most famous communist woman warrior. She appears in all school textbooks. She has two monuments, big halls dedicated to her. She has statues, she has uh, posters, two movies. One, the 1950 movie was, uh, uh, won many, many awards. The 2005 movie is uh, maybe passed without many people noticing, except me who was looking for Zhao Yiman stuff. Um, but the key thing that we see about the long history she's had of the propaganda afterlife that she, she, she has been recreated as, the main thing that we see is that the message has changed from what, over time, about what the communist government leadership wanted its population to learn about her, her, her experience. In the early years, so 1950 through to 1990s, you had the majority of the stories being told about Zhao Yiman telling us how she was a patri an exceptional woman, a heroic guerrilla fighter. Um, she went into the north, she, you know, she was a labor organizer, then she went into the forest and organized peasants and soldiers to fight the Japanese, and that this was really exceptional. She was just a heroic, unusual woman who could ride horses, shoot a gun, blow up trains, do all of these courageous acts that we would normally associate with men. And that was a, you know, pretty much a standard line. So when they say, be like Zhao Yiman, they would be saying things like, you know, go out into the factories and work hard, be like Zhao Yiman. Or go out and um, um, uh, stop being a prostitute and work in the factories, be like Zhao Yiman. De dedicate yourself to China like Zhao Yiman, because she's an exceptional woman. The other thing they used her, 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 her um, story for was to encourage men to enter the war against America in Korea. And so people would, uh, would be told, be like, men would be told, be like Dao Yiman. Don't be shamed by, don't shame your manhood by being shown up by women like Dao Yiman. And so you'd often see, particularly in the, not just in the, in the, in, in the 50s, but also in earlier periods of propagandizing about trying to get men to join the war, they would use women as hooks to get men to join. And one of the things that's really funny about this is early on in the, the Communist Party use of women as hooks to get men into war was that they often found they had more women joining and they didn't intend that to happen. They were just trying to shame the men into joining. But the women actually took it really seriously and we'll see why when we look at Xie Bingying uh, in the next slide. So the idea that you, know, you, you use women to get more men in, but you also use women to persuade women to do things they wouldn't normally do, whether that be working in the factory, working on the farm, or just participating more outside the home. But after about 1990, you see a change in the way that Zhao Yiman is used. And this relates to that central picture of her with her son. Until about 1990, people in China would have known she had a son, they knew that he existed, and you know he was, he was a feature of some of the, the stories that she had to abandon the son. But after about 1990, you see the way that the maternal-child bond is really played as the emotional hook. So we see that um, almost all of the stories that are renditions of her story that are produced after this time make a great play about how she had to sacrifice her maternal love that she couldn't manage a political life and a, a, um, a, a life as a single mum. She had to give up the child, so she sent it to, uh, 
she sent it to her, her brother-in-law to, to raise and never saw him after this photo. This is the last photo they had together. And so now we get in the propaganda afterlife of Zhao Yiman letters between mother and son that never existed. Right? Um, internal monologues being uh, recreated whereby the mother is uh, pining the, the loss of her child, her access to her child. And, and this is a, a really important emotional hook. But what it shows you as a reader, or what it's intended to show you as a reader, is that you should make this extreme sacrifice, that this is an extreme sacrifice, and that the party and the country will honour you afterwards, and that you will not be forgotten if you do make this extreme sacrifice. So it builds into a kind of like, my sacrifice is worthy. If I join up and I die, my sacrifice is worthy. But at the same time, the party still values families. It still will look after families. The country nurtures families. And it's only extreme circumstances we may lose a family member. So that's the kind of shift that's happened with Zhao Yiman. That's the uh, uh, poster from the 1950s um, movie and the statue of her in her hometown memorial in, uh, in Sichuan. The last one, Xie Bingying, is um, she lived a long time. Uh, she lived in America at the end of, for the majority of the last half of her life, and she wrote a lot. So she was one woman who controlled her own afterlife. She's one of these people who couldn't get grabbed by propaganda, for propaganda or advertising purposes. Um, she controlled what people said about her because she continued to live. So, you know, the best, the best propaganda is made by, about dead people. And those of you who know um, Chinese propaganda about Lei Feng, you know that, you know, once he died, then it could all kick in because, it, you know, a living person contradicts the story. So Xie Bingying lived a long time and that enabled her to control her message. But the other reason she wasn't harnessed by, by anyone for propaganda or total militarization purposes was because she didn't choose a political party. She joined the, uh, joined the military when the United Front of China was formed. So the communists and the nationalists were working together and they were both fighting against the warlords who were, had kind of like taken over large parts of China, were causing all sorts of chaos and making people's lives miserable. So she joined up when there was a kind of a, the beginnings of a national army with two parties working together. And when they fell apart in 1927, uh, she didn't choose to go with one or the other. And that made her difficult. They kept accusing her, both sides accusing her of being membership of the, having membership of the other party. And in the end, she just kind of like moved right away. But she kept writing about her experience as a soldier in, in the war. One of the things that's really interesting about her that uh, is also similar to Zhao Yiman, they both had to fight against their parents to get uh, an education. So they were, you know, they came from reasonable families, but the idea that you educated girls beyond primary school, even for these good families, was kind of like, you know, it's a bit of a waste of money. So her brothers supported her um, through her, uh, her, her education. They helped her when she ran away from the arranged marriage. They would provide her with reading materials, and the same with Zhao Yiman. It was her brothers who really supported her. And I think that's a real lesson in most social movements. It's not enough to have, you know, uh, women mobilising for women. We need men su supporting us as well. And so this was crucial to Xie Bingying's experience. She goes into the military forces, she writes a diary every day, she gathers and she, every day of her training, she goes into the battlefields and she writes more diaries, they get published in newspapers. She then gathers them all together and makes a book, and then she makes another book, and it, and it goes on and on. So every time she was involved in a military battle, we get a really good record of what was happening and, and what it meant to be a woman in that, in that uh, in that environment, so it's a fascinating record. But the key thing that we learn from Xie Bingying is that for her generation of women, there was no pacifist feminism. There was no point being, um, you know, uh, no, you know, make love, not war. There was no such thing. It was all, if you want women's rights, you have to get up and take a gun. There was no pacifist feminism. If you want women's rights, then you have to support the nation that is going to produce those women's rights. We have to get rid of the warlords. We have to get rid of the Japanese. So it was that kind of um, thinking that inspired Bing Ying. And she spent a lot of time as a soldier um, in the front lines, um, not the front lines, the f people who know about war would know better than the, the group that go out ahead of the troops. So they go out and, and do the propaganda work with the villages that you're going to enter in, in, to the villages you're going to enter. And, and what she found was that in this frontline, front forerunner role, that um, 
they had really great success because the villagers were used to these warlords coming in and raping and pillaging and killing all the animals, and they didn't have any women with them. At least, well, they might have had a few prostitutes, camp following, you know, uh, cooks and things, but they didn't have women soldiers. And so when Xie Bingying and her girls went in, all these young 20-year-olds walking in in military uniform and talking to the villagers, the villagers responded really well. And they could, they were, and the women would come out and have a look at these kind of bizarre creatures with big feet and riding horses, and you know, and they were they were an impressive propaganda force for the troops that were coming afterwards. They could arrange accommodation, they could arrange housing, in ways that male soldiers could not. As soon as male soldiers walked in, everyone fled. But these women soldiers walked in, softened it up, and said, "Our troops are different. Your daughters are safe. Our troops are different. Look, we are safe." And so this really worked. So Xie Bingying was, um, she saw her role as basically, uh, you know, lifting the status of women through her military participation. And, and through her story, um, I've tried to show that, you know, there is this kind of uh, absence of pacifist feminism in China, unlike UK, Australia, USA, where pacifist, fem feminist pacifism is a really common and a large, large, um, large movement. Finally, the other thing that um, I, I hope I showed in the book um, is that, uh, is what? <laughs> is that, um, no, I'll, I'll, I'll end there. I can't remember what it was. There was one more point, but I can't see it on my notes. And if I struggle to read through them, um, then that'll be it. So we'll, we'll wind it up here. I guess um, I'm kind of, uh, kind of keen to see that we, uh, as a community, start start thinking more clearly about the messages that we're being uh, presented with, that we actually interrogate them more carefully, that we don't wear camouflage fashion, and that we don't dress our kids in military uniforms and send them off to, to camp with guns, because I don't think it's cute and I don't think it's fashionable. Um, it's all feeding into a, um, a, a, not such a, good, a not such a good world. Okay, thanks very much for listening. Thanks for your time. Louise, that was fantastic, thank you. So fascinating. I mean, an area that I know nothing about and, uh, and how uh, opened uh, that world has become through those stories. Um, I think on everyone's behalf, I'd like to say it was a, a terrific presentation of a whole range of things. Um, so yes, I am someone, and I imagine most people in the room uh, would have from time to time seen the, the Chinese uh, women uh, looking militaristic. But here we have a fantastic history, an understanding of where that has come from. Uh, but linked with that, what you've brought us in is an understanding of this is the, this is the way, certainly in, early, um, in the early 21st, 20th century, this is the way women in China gained pr their prestige uh, and, and, uh, and how feminism worked in China, which is a completely different picture to what perhaps feminists like me uh, in Australia thinks about feminism. So I, I've, I've taken away many things from this, but that is a, a, um, an opening to a different way of thinking about feminism that is, uh, is very interesting to me. And although it's not about China, it, it links very well with uh, some of the arguments that, um, that are made by uh, black women feminists, indigenous women feminists, who say, look, the middle class white European way of thinking about feminism is not necessarily our way of thinking about feminism. And it, you have to have a feminism which speaks to where you are and the life you are in and the culture and the society in which you are in. Um, so I found uh, the, the development of that a very interesting conceptual uh, manner of thinking about it. I also found it extremely interesting to be thinking about 
the nature of propaganda and feminism and uh, China in a militaristic sense. Because, again, um, I'm aware of the ways in which, particularly in the First World War, in Australia, as in, in England and the United States, but I'm very aware of the Australian ones, of the, the use of women, mothers in particular, of, uh, on both sides. Um, don't send our sons to war, but equally, it is a patriotic thing to send your son to war. So, uh, so seeing that this, is, this was um, a, a use of women in the propaganda towards militarization in China uh, is, and, and in this particular way, is also a new understanding for me and a new concept. I guess the third thing uh, I'd like to comment on and, and thank you for is of uh, bringing this alive with these three women because that is something which uh, in intellectually we can think about these things, but as you said, here were three women, real women, um, and you, in a very short time, have brought them to life for us. And they're very different women, and they lived at different times, and they're, the changes that they helped bring about were different, and for different purposes. But there was this common theme that the way to move into this uh, new world for women was through militarization and using uh, that vehicle. What else can I say than thank you very, very much for presenting us with and opening up some fantastic ways of thinking and understanding about uh, women in China, about gender, but equally about what this means uh, and giving us a, uh, a sense of the, the, the terrible response that this ends up provoking, which is war and death um, and, and very poor outcomes for the people involved. So I would like you all to thank Louise very much for this, her inaugural professorial uh, um, lecture and uh, it augurs wonderfully for the rest of your professorial time here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Eileen. It falls on me to formally conclude this afternoon's fantastic inaugural lecture. I'd only share Eileen's comments and echo them, but I think what it does do is emphasize the richness of the university. We've gone in our inaugural lecture series across a full trajectory across expertise across the university. Photovoltaics, maths, environmental science, and Chinese history, and Chinese political history. And I think all of that speaks linked up to why this university is such a fantastic place to work and the strength and capability of both the staff and the students. Louise, welcome to the professoriate at UNSW. All of us look forward to working with you. And thank you for reminding us that there is a rich strain of history and perspective and cultural perspective that we don't always draw on in thinking about how we construct the problems we need to face. Please join us outside for Drinks and Nibbles to celebrate with Louise. Once again, thank you very much indeed.